Good afternoon and welcome to this incredibly gaudy Eggsies on camera and this is Safari Live. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, little Gracie, age nine in Ohio, happy birthday to you, hip hip, Hooray. hip hip, Hooray. hip hip, Hooray. Hooray. Hooray, happy birthday Gracie. These buffalo, I'm not very happy with my singing, but I don't really care. So there's some buffalo over here, and there is a herd of elephants coming this way. We sped away from the elephants because we know they're coming this way, so I'm just going to get into a position where we can see them, and then I will introduce everything properly. Okay, a whole lot of buffalo bulls. They've been lurking by the water here. I'm expecting, here come the elephants now. They're just popping out of the bush over there, and I think they're going to have to come and have a drink here. Otherwise, they might move off into the bush, but they're going to come past us regardless. Exit, they're going to come out there. There, you can see the trunk up in the air. Welcome everyone, you're on a live safari here in the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. We're on a little spit of land called Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, Arethusa we also traverse to the west of us, Cheetah Plains to the east. On the other vehicle is Brent Leo Smith. He is going to be driving towards Cheetah Plains, I believe, this afternoon with Viam Durenbrak, who will be filming him. In the final control, we have Rebecca uh, on the Vox and Louise helping her on the keys. She'll be hearing your uh, tweets or reading your tweets, giving them to Rebecca, who will in turn give them to me. And a very special happy birthday to Gracie, aged nine, in Ohio. It's her birthday today, one of our long-time favorite viewers, and I hope that you will all join me in wishing her a very happy birthday. She loves elephants. So, Gracie, here are your birthday elephants. I hope you enjoy them. We are completely live, which means we'd love to hear from you over the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live if you happen to be on Tweet Tweet Twitter. Otherwise, you can talk to us on the email, questions at wildearth.tv. Either one is just as effective as the other, except, of course, you can waffle a bit more on the email than you can on Twitter. Isn't this a wonderful sight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten buffalo, and... Well, any number of elephants, probably about the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And two young bulls coming up behind. Isn't that great? What a way to start this afternoon. It's, I'm told it's about 24 degrees Celsius out here. It feels quite a lot warmer than that. It feels to me like about 26, which sits at about 79 degrees Fahrenheit. It's probably about 24 and 76 but I'm sitting here in the sun, so it feels a little warmer than it might otherwise. Now, these elephants are drinking from an artificially pumped pan. They have chosen to drink here because it's clean water. They love clean water. We watched a lioness drink the most disgusting-looking pea soup-colored, algae-infested, dung-bespattered water the other day, and she didn't give two hoots. These elephants don't like water like that. They'd far rather have clean water like us. And that's just one of many characteristics they share with human beings. And here come two young bulls from behind, one of whom I think is going to be quite a big tusker. These two fellows still, that one coming into frame now, he's probably about 13. And the one behind, that chap, I think he's going to be very big tusked. I think he's about 15. Now look at the matriarch, just quickly exy. The matriarch's the one there with the very straight tusks. You see her there with the very straight tusks? She turned to face the two bulls. She turned to face the two bulls as they came up, and I guarantee you she said something to them with that low infrasonic rumble. She could well be the mother of one or two of them, if not, yeah, one or both of them. And she gave them a warning, as if to say, you can come and drink, but don't horse around and cause nonsense. I won't put up with it. 
All right, we're going to sit here a little bit longer with these elephants. Let's see what happens. And while we do that, go across to Brent Leo Smith. He'll give you his plans for the afternoon and introduce you to the tiny Viam Dorenbrach at the same time. Welcome, welcome, and first and foremost, a huge happy birthday to Gracie. I see the elephants have already made an appearance for your birthday. Uh, but for those of you who missed it, I'm Brent, and I have the fantastic VM on camera, and that is a kudu ball. And he's looking slightly bemused. What are these silly people talking about? Of course, so wonderful uh, to have elephants appear for Gracie's uh, birthday. We know it's her favorite. So our plan is to head down towards Cheetah Plains. I've heard a whisper of Nkanyeni and her cubs, the slight possibility, a leopard we haven't seen for a long time. And also always good to just go double check what's happening at the east. And while that kudu meanders off into the river Rhine thickets, uh, let's not keep Gracie from her elephants with James. So we will be back later. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the bushwalk segment of this afternoon sunset safari here on Juma Private Game Reserve. I'm Steph, and on camera today we have Brian. And just out of camp today, we've already walked into two of our dangerous game. We've got some elephants that are approaching the dam, the Vuyatela Dam. We literally just walked out of camp. We're, not, we're still within sight of the dam itself. We've got some Ellies there. And they're coming down to drink. And then we've got a buffalo bull that was just sitting in the water. And I think he's been disturbed by the elephant because that's what he's busy looking at. And there he moves off. He doesn't feel like sharing his mud puddle today with anything. I actually think that this is going to be such a nice place to sit and share this particular elephant sighting with. Elephant on foot, particular herds of elephant on foot are what's the most scary for me out here. And the reason for that is they're intelligent, and they're intelligent enough to have an overreaction to a perceived threat for their babies. In other words, they can imagine what it would be like for something to threaten their babies, unlike a, a, a more simple-minded animal. Um, it sounds a bit derogatory, to be quite honest. I don't quite know if I wanted to say it in that particular sense. <laughs> All I'm saying to you is that being on foot with an elephant, in particular elephant herd with babies, is a lot more dangerous than anything else. No lion, no leopard is as dangerous as what those things are. That said, though, we've got the wind coming directly into our face, which means that all the soap and all the food that we've been eating today doesn't get washed onto these elephants. They don't have to deal with that insecurity as well. And we are far away from them. We're about 300 yards from them at the moment. And they probably can't even hear us, to be quite honest. They definitely can't see us. I don't think they can hear us, and I don't think they can smell us. And I think for that reason, even though we are standing in the wide open here, I think that they're actually going to come down to the water and we probably will be able to get quite a nice view of them. So the trick now for Brian and I is to stay inconspicuous in the open. And now that is going to prove a challenge. Where do you think, Brian? Should we go and stand in the shade a little bit, I think? Yeah, It'll probably work a bit better, hey? And boiling to death here in the sun. So we're just going to move forward a little bit. I'm going to watch that female elephant in the lead, the matriarch. I'm going to watch her for any reaction that she may have to us and she absolutely has shown no reaction to us whatsoever carrying on feeding it's quite common for elephant to walk up to water and then stop there for a little bit before they come and i think while we're waiting for them to do their ritual it'll be a good idea to send you through to james who has also got an elephant and probably a lot closer than where we are right now Now that elephant has not changed colour, everybody. What she's done is covered herself in water and as Eggsy was saying to me, he says it just looks so nice, doesn't it? And what he means, of course, is that it looks so refreshing to have put that cooling water over her head and ears to have bathed herself. And what I think is quite interesting, if you look at her, it doesn't look like her skin has rejected it, if you know what I mean. It looks like the water has been absorbed into the skin. Now. Elephants actually don't have very waterproof skin. It's quite sort of porous. 
and you can see that the skin has actually absorbed that water much more than your and my skin would just water there's no mud in that that's plain water that she's put on herself and I'm pretty sure she must be the <laughs> she must be the matriarch unless the big one behind her is I'm just laughing because she looks like a walrus there I shouldn't say that too loud I'm sure she can hear me but she really does look like a walrus doesn't she I suppose that's a good way of remembering her we'll call this the walrus herd now you'll notice with elephants if they are going to have a drink they'll often stand around like this if they're going to throw mud on themselves only it's kind of a quick 30 seconds into the water and then they're out and these chaps are spending some time here the buffalo also that are lying to the right hand side of them they are will be watching them they'll be just looking and being very aware of these enormous animals because elephants often don't like to have their water threatened and they don't like to think that anyone else is going to challenge them for their water let's go back to the walrus Eggsy she's doing some quite interesting things see she's smelling and now she's scratching her ear with her trunk she was looking towards us with her trunk and what I mean is she's basically pointing it at us and sniffing the air I don't think she is the matriarch I just want to see behind if that's a bull or a cow behind her but you can see she's the second largest cow in this herd it's normally the biggest but not always she just looked like she was leading it earlier on when we first found them walking in a line towards this water Hello Gracie, age nine. You say you're very happy with your elephants. You've got an elephant and a hippo cake and some balloons and you love us all. Well, we love you too, Gracie. And we hope that you have a very, very happy day there in summertime in Ohio. It's the best time to have your birthday in summer, isn't it? Now, this cow has been quite interesting. She's, see how she's kind of, she's fiddling with her tusks there. She's not I don't think she's actually cleaning them. I think what she's doing is sort of displacement behavior. She's kind of fidgeting. Something's making her feel uncomfortable. It might be the buffalo. She might be just feeling quite irritated. Watch her now with these buffalo. Let's see what she does. See that swinging of the foot? That is very typical. Sort of displacement behavior. Not feeling very comfortable about something. See, they don't take a chance. They're up. And that buffalo is massive. You must understand that buffalo is probably 900 kilograms. She's definitely the matriarch. See, she's leading them away through the buffalo. That buffalo is a ton, almost a ton. Probably not quite, but almost. 800 kilograms, about 2,000 pounds, right? And look at how it is dwarfed by those elephants. The big matriarch, probably about four and a half tons, 4,500 kilograms, 10,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal. She stands about nine feet at the, at the shoulder. And she's leading her little herd through a very difficult time as we head towards the business end of the dry season at the back end of quite a severe drought. So this is not easy times for the elephants. Now, just come back here, Eggsy. Look at that one there. There we are. You see this little thing here? He's probably a bull, probably a young bull. And he's thinking to himself, hmm, what's going on with these buffalo here? A little bit nervous. Or he's thinking, you know what, I'm just feeling like a bit of a game here. But look how he moves with the other bull. The other bull's obviously reassuring him or telling him what's happening, telling them what the form is. No, he's nervous of them. See that? See how he ran through the little gauntlet of buffalo? And I mean, they pose no threat to him whatsoever. 
I'd love to actually go and stand next to that buffalo so that you could see how massive he was and therefore again how massive the elephant is. They're so silent, they're almost completely silent as they walk off into the bush there. You can hardly hear them. There is not a bird singing. Except one bird, the red-faced mouse bird. I can hear it way in the distance going, toot -oot, toot -oot, toot -oot, toot -oot. But Otherwise, the only sound is the slosh of water underneath the trunk of those elephants. These will be three bulls. The really little ones staying only because these bigger brothers are there. Hello, Laura. Um, good question from you, just uh, the answer is no, not in this particular pan. You say, can these elephants swim? Elephants can swim. I think they walk on the bottom largely. I'm not sure that they're actually capable of floating too well. Um, because they cross enormous rivers, so I'm going to say yes, they can swim, I'm pretty sure they can. And they stick their trunks up, and you often see them uh, going across rivers with just these trunks like snorkels above the water. And they won't swim here, obviously, because that pan is only about a foot deep. So they won't be doing any swimming here. But they cross enormous rivers, they cross the Zambezi, a strong, strong flowing river on the borders between Zambia and Zimbabwe and they go on to the islands there, they swim across Lake Kariba so yes they can swim very well now hello all of the teachers at Lansdowne Learning Conference of Virginia Beach, Virginia, United States of America and nice to have you with us, welcome uh, please talk to us over the course of the next 35 minutes I think that's all you've got with us this afternoon so I hope you have a good time and uh, enjoy we're going to look at some elephants here we're going to hopefully go and find some lions a little bit later Brent is probably heading off to Cheetah Plains to see if he can find some leopards so with any luck uh, we'll have a pretty action-packed three hours not sure what we'll get through in the next 30 five minutes things tend to happen at their own pace out here and that's just the way we like it but you're most welcome talk to us hashtag safari live or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to ask us a question on the email that uh, cracking sound was because there's a camp just nearby it's called Gallego camp it's over there and there's some guests in there and they get to watch these elephants while they're sipping on their afternoon snifter Hello Stacy, you're with the Virginia Beach contingent in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, you want to know how old the youngest elephant is there and how I, how I know how old he is. I would put him at about eight years, Stacy, maybe a little bit younger. The way I know that is simply through experience. You just see them and you spend some time with more experienced people in the bush and then you get a rough idea for sizing them up. Elephants, it's quite nice because they grow their whole lives, you see, so they never stop growing, which means that the bigger they are, the older they are. There isn't a massive variation in size within a region. Between regions, elephants obviously uh, do, do change sizes, so a 10-year-old here might be slightly different size from a 10-year-old in Angola or in Amboseli, which is in Kenya. In fact, one of them is a cow. The one on the left is a cow. And I would put her at about 25, maybe 30 years old. Mm, no, not quite. Maybe 20. 20, 25. And the little one, I'd say, yeah, about 6 to 8 years old. You can tell a little bit by their tusks. You can see those tusks have just come out. And they've been growing for some time. Tina, you're worried about these buffalo, and you say if a baby buffalo got lost, how would the mother find it? Well, uh, it's unlikely there'd ever be a baby buffalo in this group because they're all uh, bachelors, and they've moved away from the breeding herd, so they're not around with the little ones anymore. But in a big breeding herd, the youngster will bellow, make a loud bellowing noise, and somehow the mothers seem to know the sounds of their own babies. They also know the smell of their own babies. So they would find them like that. Um, but if it got lost and separated from the herd, say the herd was stampeded by lions that were trying to hunt them during the night, 
well, then it would be very, very difficult. The mother might stay in the herd bellowing, trying to find the baby, but I'm not sure that it would always be found. And sometimes that uh, alarming baby's call can result in it being killed by predators that hear the distress call. Chrissy, you want to know this is a family of elephants. No, it's not. It's the back end of a herd. And a herd of elephants is made up, Chrissy, of a matriarch. She leads the herd. She's the oldest female. And uh, it's normally her sort of related uh, siblings or certainly relations, cousins maybe, and their offspring. So we don't really refer to it as a family so much as a herd of elephants. The bulls, so the father of these elephants, will be nowhere near this herd. Uh, sometimes he might join up with them. Uh, sometimes he might never see them again after having mated. And so the bulls play very little role in child rearing, but they do play a very important mentorship role with the young bulls when they grow older and they're forced to leave the herd. So that young bull that we've been looking at, the one I said that was eight years old, that fellow, when he eventually has to leave the herd when he's 18 or so, he will hopefully have the mentorship of an older bull. Hello, Corman. You want to know what predators of these elephants are? Well, really, there are only two that could possibly kill an elephant. Uh, a big pride of lions, it would have to be a massive pride of lions, and maybe a really big clan of spotted hyena. Otherwise, they'd really, there was nothing else that would threaten these animals. And in the Kruger Park, it's highly unusual to see elephants killed by predators, unless they're very sick or very young and somehow get separated from the herd. But the herd is tremendously protective of the little ones. So were this little chap that you're looking at now to be set upon by a pride of lions, you can be sure that the rest of the herd would chase the lions. And the lions wouldn't hang around. So it, it plays like Botswana and Savuti, where it gets very dry and the elephants get very nutritionally stressed and very weak during the droughts and dry seasons. Then it's not that unusual for lions to take very small elephants, but it is unusual here. And an elephant almost has to be completely infirm for hyenas to take it. Now, if we go across to the right-hand side there, Eggsy, there's a rather ridiculous-looking buffalo. You see him there? It looks like he's got, um, well, he looks a bit like a sort of, um, what would we say, a, a, I don't know what he looks like. He, he looks like he's painted his face with mud. But actually... He's lost all the hair on his face because he's so old, he's lost a horn. He looks rather ghostly, doesn't he? He looks like he should, I know what he looks like, he looks like he should be in a New Orleans carnival walking down the road. You know what I mean? His little hips all sticking out. Almost like he's had his skull painted onto his head. And here's a nice answer for you, Stacy. It's being answered for you as we speak. You say, do elephants cohabit happily together? Well, just look at this little elephant here. We just missed his ears out. He's avoiding these buffalo, and he's moving around them. The buffalo will be very afraid of adult elephants. The little, you see, he's just opening his ears because he's a little nervous of the big buffalo. And they don't, they don't live, I mean, they don't try and hurt each other. In the odd occasion, a rogue bull might kill a buffalo, but it's very unusual. But elephants are nervous of what they don't know. And that young elephant obviously doesn't have huge experience of buffalo. And buffalo, too, are not to be trifled with. Although these fellows look like sort of docile cattle, they most certainly are not. And if they are threatened, they get very angry very quickly. All righty, while that buffalo settles down, or just quickly over there, that buffalo is just scratching his undercarriage on a rather unpleasant-looking stick. Ooh, I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Let's head across to Brent. He's got another elephant in the far east. Well, Gracie, it seems like all the elephants are out for your birthday, and, of course, welcome to Lansdowne as well. Now, this is the opposite to what James got. This is a single elephant bull, a uh, youngish, probably, I'd guess, close on 30 years old. And I'm trying to have a look. It doesn't look like he's had a drink yet. I think he might be heading towards the waterhole. There we can see. 
Oh, a bit of a dust bath. Uh, it's pretty, pretty big. I guess he's probably weighing in at about five tons. Uh, probably just over 10 or 11,000 pounds. And there is the ever present opportunist of the bush. The fork tailed drongo follows all sorts of animals as they move for the bush, hoping that they'll disturb an insect that it can pounce on. So he's not too far away from three in a row pan. There is some water there. It's going to be interesting to see if he makes his way towards there. Hi, Liz. Uh, Liz is wondering, what's the temperature currently? And what's, how much rainfall is there normally? I think it's about 24 degrees Celsius. And I can't remember for the life of me that in Fahrenheit, but I guess it's around 70, and if I, my, my memory serves me correct. And normally we have around 350 to 400 millimeters of rain a year. This year I would say we're lucky if we've had 120. So we're in the worst drought since 1993. 92, 93, caused by the El Nino weather system. Now there's great speculation at the moment whether because of El Nino during the first part of the year, we're going to get a La Nina during the second part of the year, which creates a mass, massive deluge of water. I don't think so. I think we're going to be in for a very dry period. Oh. Eric's wondering, are male elephants solitary? Why don't they travel with the herds? Uh, they occasionally have loose associations with the herds, and the only time they really put effort into sticking with a breeding herd is if there's a female in estrus. Now, elephants are quite unique in the fact that they will only mate when the male is in must, which is a heightened hormonal state, and the female is in estrus. And the males must cycles. Uh, the bigger you are, the stronger you are. Those must cycles coincide with the most female Easter cycles. The smaller you are, the weaker you are, uh, you've got to try mate when there's less females that have Easter cycles. And it is nowhere set uh, in Africa, different parts of Africa, depending on rainfall, food availability, and all sorts of things like that. And that is all dependent on when those must cycles fall. But speaking about elephants, uh, it seems like James has got some more. We have not moved, everybody. Another herd of elephant came bung bumbling out of the bushes along exactly the same path as the first one did. And one of these buffalo was trying to have a drink and um, the elephant, the matriarch at the front, picked up a trunk full of water and sprayed it at him, and he went bustling off. But bustling is not something he did with great aplomb. If we look at him there, there is that buffalo. Stacy, you're wondering about whether elephants get ticks. They don't get many ticks, and it's because they don't have sweat glands. That's one of the reasons they don't get ticks, Stacy. Thank you for that, and it's also one of the reasons they don't have ox peckers on them. This chap here is on his last legs. And I think you'll find that he has got bovine tuberculosis. This is not unusual for the buffalo of the Kruger National Park. It happens all the time. But because we've been in a drought, I think that he's really starting to struggle. You can see he's very skinny. And he's been sitting here while you've been gone going... <coughs> <coughs> and so I don't think he's in a very good way. And this is what TB does. We talk quite a lot about bovine tuberculosis. Many people know that it is in the Kruger National Park, has been for many years. It doesn't have a huge effect on the animals unless, of course, they happen to be nutritionally compromised. So he's not getting enough to eat, and so the disease is starting to take hold in his body. And you can see that from the wasting of his muscles. And there go the elephants. On to more cheery things. The rest of these bulls look fine actually. None of them look vaguely like they are uh, in distress. In fact there's one lying on the ground there that you can see he's the fattest buffalo I've ever seen.
Righty. I think we should move on and see if we can't find those lions. I just want to have one more look at the New Orleans. I, I, does anybody know what I mean by this? Please, if you, um, if you know what I mean. I, I, the only thing I can think of is a character from a James Bond film, uh, from Octopussy, where, I th was it Octopussy? No, it wasn't. It was the one with Jane Seymour in it. That may have been Octopussy. Anyway, this guy, this, uh, he's got that kind of uh, makeup on him that he makes him look like he should be uh, in a carnival in New Orleans. If anybody can help me, please send through a word, the word I'm looking for. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Let's go across to Steph, who is still on foot, find out what he's discovered, and I'm now really, this, definitely, possibly, this time, going to find the lions. Well, welcome back to the bushwalk, and uh, we haven't found much on foot, uh, James, to be quite honest. We have discovered something to, to tickle the mind. Some of the elephant dung that we're finding at the moment has got this very powdery surface to it, and it took us at least 20 minutes to solve the riddle. And the culprit is the harvested termites. And we've just come into this area which is now devoid completely of vegetation. In between us, you'll see between the trees, you'll notice that it's just sand. And that's because these little termites are furiously collecting any bit of vegetation, dead, alive, or otherwise, and they've even gone so far as to start uh, using the, the wood inside elephant dung. Can you believe how desperate they're getting in this drought that we've got? I'm going to see if I can find you some as I'm speaking. I think a good idea would be to just, what you're looking for is this circle of cut twigs and cut branches around a hole. Sometimes the hole is clogged up with some mud, other times it's not. And now, obviously because I want to show you this, it's going to be one of the rarest things to find on earth, even though they are everywhere. Now, I've heard some, some reports saying that up to three and a half thousand kilograms of vegetation per hectare can be taken off of these fields. Now, a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, and a hectare is about 100 yards by 100 yards. You can do that sum for yourself, and you realize that even at 3.5 ton per hectare, you're looking at scales that are almost commercial in their stripping of the bush of, uh, of vegetation. Now, you always think, could it be an elephant? But it's actually these little termites, and I just want to show you how they're mining this piece of elephant dung. There is the mine of the termites. They protect themselves using that clay and uh, other organic matter tunnel cement. But from the top, you'll see it just looks like a normal pile of elephant dung. See if we can catch some of them at work. Look how they've mined the inside of that elephant dung, almost empty. That's incredible. Have a look there. Now, ob the obvious reason about nutrients, the nutrient cycle, is that these termites are helping to cycle nutrients through the soil. They aerate the soil because this is what it basically looks like underneath the soil where they live as well. It's aerated, they die, they provide a type of compost in their feces, they take seeds, they take grasses, they take wood, they, they basically just re-energize and reinvigorate the soil around areas like this. And it's this that keeps this type of pristine bush so alive and so vibrant. The fact that underneath our feet, even though the summer hasn't even set in a little bit yet, underneath our feet, a pile of elephant dung that was once a tree and once a bush and once a rock, now goes back into the soil and helps to energize the soil again and keep it nice and, and good for trees and bushes and grass to grow on it again. Amazing, hey? Stacy, you've just asked me how termites are affected by the drought. That's actually quite a good question. You get two different types of termites, broadly speaking, here. You get termites that farm fungus, and that is how they get their food. And you get termites, like we've just had a look at right now, that eat woody species of plants, and they have a microbe in their tummy that digests that wood, and then they digest that microbe. That's how they get their, their nutrients. The farming termites, or macrotermies, are dependent on water. Except that 
their houses, their termite mounds, go so deep, they almost reach the water table. The bottom levels of a, of a termite mound can actually be submerged on a very, very wet year. And I'm not convinced that we've been dry for that long. The last wet season we had here was 2012. I'm not convinced that we've been dry for so long that the biggest termite mounds here will, have, will be dry. In other words, we'll have no access to water. They are big. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been around for hundreds of years and seen many droughts like this. As for the, the, uh, the, the, the microtermies, the termite that eats the wood and then digests the little microbe in their tummy, they are not water dependent. They get enough water and enough and basically nutrients from the wood and from the leaves and from the branches that they eat. I'm sure that they would require some type of, of, of water, but you don't see them walking to pools of water and drinking and going back again. You hardly ever see that. My feeling is that because similar to the farming termites, the deeper that their, that their houses go, the deeper that their termite mounds go, the closer they get to the water table. And even though it's several meters below where we're standing right now, they'd be able to churn it up and, and get it and utilize that moisture. So I'm not too sure that there are, uh, well, let me say, uh, there are termite, there are drought resistant, look at me trying to mix up my words. They're drought resistant um, to the point of probably being better able to cope with drought than most other animals. Yeah. Ah. Caroline has asked me a nice question, the inevitable question is if it wasn't a drought at the moment, would the termites still be eating dung? That's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is, let me just get out of the sun over here so Brian doesn't have to, waving furiously at me and don't walk there. <laughs> the second part is how would the termites eating the dung in a drought affect dung beetles since they also utilize dung balls uh, or dung piles for their nutrients? Uh, Caroline, so for the first part of your, of your question, I've always noticed termites utilizing dung, but not to the degree that I've noticed today. So today we are reaching this pinnacle of this drought that we're in at the moment, and today I've noticed something I haven't seen before, and that they re the termites are really reworking through this dung. So yes, drought does make termites utilize dung more. So the second part of your question, which has to do with the dung beetles, the lucky for the dung beetles, they're only really active in the summertime. They're not active in the winter. We haven't had any rain yet, and so the dung beetles are still in these balls of dung. They're around about this big, or the biggest ones are around about this big, where the larvae of the dung beetle is busy eating dung that was collected by their parents last summer and is buried somewhere. They're still busy doing that. As soon as the first rains come, and for how, who knows how they know about it, but as soon as the first rains soften up the soil, then they break out of these balls and they start flying around. We start seeing dung beetles here by, ooh, it's going to be a guess now. You know, it's one of these things. It's happened year on year for two decades almost, and I still can't remember the exact day dung beetles emerge. Let's say after the first rains in October, we'll start seeing the first dung beetles, and they'll reach a peak at around about January, February, um, where just every single dung pile here is just it's a mass of dung beetles, really something truly spectacular to see. But on that note, and equally spectacular, is James, who has got an update for you. See you later. Hello, everybody. I'm so spectacular. I'm not really. Now, thank you very much, Stephen. Live and Let Die was the movie, that's correct, where Jane Seymour played the part of a solitaire, I believe. Now... I don't know why we're getting to the lions. I just, I'm going to ruin the song for you, Live and Let Die by Paul McCartney and the Wings, because there's a horrible grammatical error in the main line that I have never managed to get over. And it's like this. The words go, but in this ever-changing world in which we live in. There are just too many ins in that sentence, but they fit the music, you see. And I, uh, I get, uh, every time I listen to it, it does that to me. Right. Now, <laughs> I hope that has been beneficial information to you from the Lansdowne Learning <laughs> Conference. <laughs> we don't always talk about that sort of stuff, only when we're getting to the lions. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope we will see you and many of your kids uh, on safari again fairly soon. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
I'm just going to find the lions. Just hum that song to yourself, you'll know what I mean. But in this ever-changing world in which we live in, too many inns. Now, the lions were around here this morning. Eggsy, you've spotted the lions. Now, Eggsy, have you recovered from, from this morning? Everyone, if you weren't watching this morning, Eggsy the Magnificent was approached by the lioness. Ah, blurry safaris. Very nice, Eggsy. Well done. They're just under the bushes there, everyone, and we're going to go closer right now and we'll see what those little cubs are doing. I always think it's a good idea to start a lion sighting like this because it shows you, if Eggsy zooms out, how difficult they are to see. See that? <laughs> They're so beautifully hidden at this time of the year. All right, let's go in there and see what we can have a look at. There are at least two adults there. Eggsy, there was one male here that this morning, wasn't there? He's lying right there, is he? Thank you so much. Just have a little bit less instruction. Cat and Tampa, you say you can't believe how close that lioness got to young Eggsy this morning. It sounds amazing, I must say. Now we've got the male there, two females to the left, and the cubs that side. I think the cubs are likely to be more active than anyone else is. Ach, let's go in here, let's see what the view's like. I just don't want to run the male over on the way to the cubs, he might get upset. Not so, Eggsy. And as you are riding pinion, in fact there are three females. Maybe even four. I think it's just the three of them. Hello, big fella. I'm just going to ease the effect. He will go straight back to sleep. Oh, these are the older cubs. Four lionesses and the older cubs. Eggsy, is that right for you? Hmm? little back. Say what? So we've got five cubs there. Thank you very much for telling me to watch my head, Eggsy. That's very good. You must learn to instruct me. That is correct. Fear not. And if you heard him there, everybody, he said sorry after he told me to move my head. This is completely unnecessary. Brian and Viam just slapped me. Um, now, Take note, we've got the five older cubs here. I'm not sure where the others are today. I don't know if they were here this morning. Is this exactly the same sighting you had, Iggy? Yes. Remember, we had dire predictions for that one injured cub. There were predictions that its pelvis was broken, its hip was dislocated, its femur was almost certainly rent in two. And yet, here it is. And it's always amazing to see the unbelievable, um, I've lost the word, begins with R, Eggsy. Recovery. No, not recovery. Oh, come on. The unbelievable <laughs> resilience. There we go, Eggsy. The unbelievable resilience of these animals, their ability to heal is astounding. Ah, this is wonderful. I'm hopefully going to settle in for a long session here. If any luck, they'll start to move around a bit. Ooh, now these lines are not going anywhere, especially that fat lump there. So let's go across to Steph, who has got a terrifyingly venomous insect. Not insect, arachnid, sorry. <laughs> yes, it definitely is a terrifying arachnid. It is a scorpion. And this is the olive thick-tailed scorpion. And probably responsible for the most stings that we have in this particular area. Incredibly painful sting that comes from this particular scorpion. Even though this one is a baby, probably half the size of an adult, this still wallops enough of a punch 
to put you flat on your back, crying like a little baby that's hammered a finger in the door or with a, a brick or something, they pack a mighty wallop. And that is because scorpion venom is keyed to mammal pain receptors. How about that for an interesting fact, eh? That scorpion venom talks to mammalian pain receptors in a way that very little else on earth does. And it has a defense mechanism, obviously. Lots of, well, I'm sure lots of mammals would like to eat scorpions, from mongoose all the way through to civet and honey badger, etc., etc. And the, the evolution of a painful sting is just one of those things as a deterrent. But it serves another function. It also serves to start the digestive process of prey, so it is very similar to a spider. It allows the digestion to occur externally, making it easier for the scorpion to eat its prey. And then it also subdues the female. The male will quite often sting the female when they are about to mate, and it calms the female down. I know it sounds a bit weird, but they obviously know what they're doing, having been on the planet for over 200 million years. Now, to give you an idea of how small this little guy is, let me just put a tiny piece of grass here. It's going to come into frame now. Have a look at that. Now, what you can see is the pincers. There is a pincer there, the end of the one pincer. Those two black knobs that you're looking at there are the chelicerae. That's where his mouth sits. They're almost like two crab claws, and he'll use those. Those come out and will actually chew up the prey. There's claws inside there, and then his mouth or her mouth lies on the inside of that little groove. There are a row of eyes there, but there are also two eyes there and there. You can see those little bumps? Uh, there, sorry, there and there. Those are two eyes on top of the scorpion's head, and they have about eight others as well. So two claws, eight legs, and here's the tail coming over, covered in these very fine hairs. Those hairs have got a special word. It's called, well, they're called a special word, trichobothria, and they can actually sense air pressure movements around them. Can you believe it? And that is how they find a place to sting, catch with the pincers, subdue with a, with a, with a sting, start the digestive process, suck it up through their mouth part, get fatter, get bigger, mate a little bit, rinse and repeat. That is this little scorpion. But before we go over to James, I want to show you how truly tiny this particular scorpion is. Give us a little bit of time just to zoom out from the other universe that we're in at the moment. And have a look. There's my fingernail. Sorry about Steph's frozen frame there, everybody. I'm not, of course, referring to his skeleton, but to the freezing of the broadcast frame. Now, Rebecca, would you just read out the profound information that has come from Annie Mal? Everybody, my mystery and my... Here we go. It's living, right... The song, Live and Let Die, Paul McCartney and the Wings, which was ruined for me because I was not hearing the lyrics correctly. It's world in which we're living, not live in. I can't tell you the relief I feel right now. I'm not being the slightest bit sarcastic. It has bugged me forever. <laughs> and now, Annie Mal, you have sorted that out for me. Thank you very much. Ah, I feel like a great weight has been lifted from my shoulders as we watch that ridiculous little lion cub. Isn't he cute? Oh, no, look at that. That's too much. If I was allowed to squeal, I would. Now, remember, everyone, in the little cubs, we found two little lionesses and one little lion. Now, let's see if we can't get an idea of what's going on here. I don't know if Brent managed to do that this morning. The only way to do it is to get a really good look behind the tail. 
Oops. Oh, this is going to be good. I love seeing the males with the cubs. It's one of my favorite things. How cool is that? All we hear is how awful the males are with the babies. Oh, it's so fun when they do this. I just love it. <laughs> and they've all got up, just like little human kids would. When Dad gets up, they all want to go and say hi. Uh, that doesn't normally happen with humans, though. He's just marking his territory and relieving himself, obviously. And look at the little ones. They're just so happy to be around Dad. It's my favorite, favorite lion thing, everyone. The males with the cubs. How many vehicles are on? That was the game drive radio. Sorry about that. Oh, that's just great. Let's see what happens here. We might try and move just now. Now he's doing some f Flemin grimace. So he's just testing the urine that he smelt, seeing what's in it. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> I'd love to try and move a bit, everyone, but I fear I'm going to break. It's, as Rebecca says, she's exactly right. It says she says it's like they're waiting for story time. It's exactly what it's like. Oh. <laughs> You see how they love him? It's just, it's so cool. Um, are you getting a decent shot there? Are you, are you satisfied with that? Or would you like me to try and get through these blocks? Let me just move through this bush, everyone, slowly. Will you just tell me if you get hit by a tree, Eggsy? through the medium of a gentle squeak scream. Yes, as Rebecca says, he went and be All right. You caught me in the process of just walking into my favorite, favorite place here in the bush. It's a little place that's within walking distance of the camp, but it's basically an elephant rest, resting spot, a rest camp. In summertime, this is one of the biggest wallows that we have around here. And you can just see the oozes of mud that's everywhere. At the moment, there's no mud in here. It's completely solid. But in summertime, if I had to come and walk in here, I'd be almost waist deep in water and mud. An elephant in the heat of the summer would absolutely come and wallow inside here, spray mud over themselves, and really get a good coating of mud. And then they go for a snooze during the, the heat of the day. And I'm going to take you to the snoozing spot. And it's because it's such a peaceful spot that I like to bring you here from time to time. I like to come here from time to time. And it's just around the corner. And towards the end of winter, tough to see. But if you look in the distance, while I'm walking down this pathway, you'll actually see where the elephant's bed is. You'll start to see there where Herbie's walking in the distance there. He's just making sure there's no elephant sleeping in, the, in, in there for us. Is this bed of elephant dung. You can see it's almost a carpet of it that's over there. And that's because the Tambuti thicket that we're going to go into now gets so thick of leaves. Deep shade, Tambuti thicket, close to a mud pool, and you've got the perfect recipe for an elephant hideaway. To come deeper into it, let me just share this little grove with you.
have a look at this. You can just see underneath this old, gnarled tambuiti where the elephants have walked. I'm going to walk in over here and show you where they go and scrape their mud off of their bellies. You can have a look at this. How beautiful is that? All that flaky mud. Have a look at here where they've rubbed the bar completely smooth. And they would rest for a couple of hours during the heat of the day. And then as soon as it gets cooler again, they will go and back to feeding and back to their, back to their habits, basically, without getting too hot. And on that note, and because James has got his signal back, we're going to be sending you back through to those lion cubs that you were stolen away from in a bit. See you. <laughs> We've moved quite a lot, everybody. We've come closer. You lost signal, I'm afraid, because Eggsy had to put the aerial down to get under a fairly substantial bush. But I think we're in a better position now. We can see all the adults lying together. Now, I said they love to be around Dad. I'm not sure that he knows if he's the father or not. I'm pretty sure that they don't know who their father is, but they know that he's either their father or their uncle. Oh, this is great. <coughs> now, I'm wondering if I'm correct about their ages. I think the oldest ones, they were born on Torchwood, around a place called First Rock, and I think they were born in May. Is that correct? Maybe late May. May, June, July, August. Yeah, I'd put them at about... No, I'd say they're probably about 12 weeks old. Maybe, let's say, 1st of June. If I'm wrong, then I apologize. So that would be June, July. Hmm. No, I'm going to say May. I think they're pushing, I think that they're pushing sort of 14 weeks now. Then the younger ones, born <coughs> probably just north of Gallagher Pan, they must be, you can see, they just don't have quite the same shape yet. They don't have the gangliness of the others. Uh, that's an older one there. Then, if you go completely to the right-hand side, yeah, like that one there, that pale one there, that paler one, I think they're about eight weeks old. Maybe nine. Maybe nine weeks old. And then, of course, the others just pushing maybe six weeks. So I think I've got that right. So let's go at the moment with 14, 9, and 6. Does everyone think that, that sounds okay? I think I've got that correct. I also just want to grab the binos now and see if we can't try and get the sexes of them all. That's a little lion. That's a male there, the one that just stood up with his flicking his tail there. Hello, Jay Atkinson. Good question. You ask, why do lions chew branches? Well, same reason. There's another male. There's two males there. Someone's just rolled over. They chew branches for the same reason that dogs chew branches and the same reason that we give teething rings to kids. It just helps to develop the jaw muscles, which they, of course, have to develop if they're going to be successful lions. It also probably helps with the teething process and... I think because they do lose these teeth, you know, they have milk teeth that then fall out and then they get their permanent teeth and I think that's probably a fairly painful process in the same way that it is for human beings and the chewing just helps that. But I also think there's just a bit of play behavior. Play behavior, of course, plays a very important role from a behavioral and a physiological point of view. It helps them to... Um, it helps the muscles to develop, the nervous system to develop fully, and so that's all part of it. But I think it's, I think it's largely to develop those jaw muscles. Yeah, we've definitely got two males in this group of five. The two on the left-hand side there, yep, that's one of them. The one next to him is also male. Those are two males. And we'll see about the others. Of course, they'll probably get in amongst each other, and then I won't know the difference anymore. It's so difficult to try and understand the difference between the two cubs, or between the different individuals. 
because they're just they're not like leopards they don't have those unique spot patterns you know that when we had old uh, well they were George and Charlotte of course now Shongilia and Hosanna when they were very little from very early on they had different colored eyes they had very obviously different spot patterns and these chaps just don't have that if you have enough time you can count the whisker spots just next to the nose but I mean if you see them quickly it's almost impossible to do This is a fantastic sighting, all these lions, and of course lion adults tend to be deeply boring at this time of the day because all they do is snooze, as these ones are doing, but the little ones, well, a bit like little human beings, they're not a huge fan of the afternoon nap. And looks like it's spoiling to sp <laughs> Rina, all cats like cuddling. You say, is it normal for the males to be around the females like this so close you thought they like to keep their distance? The males don't always like to keep their distance. In fact, I would suggest quite strongly that it's the females who prefer to keep their distance from the males. That's because the males tend to be largely scavengers. Or, or, you know, they'll come and steal food from the females. They'll only really want to be around these females unless they, when they're in estrus. I think Amber Eyes is probably in estrus. And Amber Eyes is this one right close to us here. That's her there. And, uh, you know, they're, they're all, they're social. They like to be social. They like to be with each other. And so, no, I, I don't think this is unusual at all. I think it's quite usual. It's a beautiful little sighting we have going here. So exhausted. All right, while these cats are flat doing nothing at all, Let's head across to Brent Leo Smith, who's on Cheetah Plains, and get an update from him. We just heard a, a squirrel alarm calling. Oh, VM, but that's not a squirrel. Okay, the bottom of this terminator. Yeah, well done, VM. You, VM, you're so quick. Look at that. A striped skink. And he just caught something. It's our most common skink species we get out here. And it could be a new species for a lot of our new viewers. We don't see too many reptiles too clearly. There we go, a little striped skink. Now we heard a squirrel alarm calling around here. Let's see if that skink does anything. He might pounce on some other unexpected insect. And I got a report that in Kanyeni's two cubs were hanging around on these open areas. So we've been sitting quietly and listening. We heard some, not the most convincing squirrel alarm calls, but alarm calls nonetheless. So we're going to keep checking around the open plains for these leopards and hopefully even maybe a cheetah. And, oh, there's a skink heading out into the sun. It's going to go bask. But we're going to leave him be because Steph has found an interesting bird on Bushwalk. And from a skink basking in the sun to the skink's nemesis, this particular little barred owlet, one of the dwarf owls that we have out here, is having a close inspection of us. Typical habitat on the side of a riverbank for this little owlet. That's as big as they get. He's probably about as big as a Coca-Cola can or a beer can. No bigger than that. Tiny. Brian is doing a fantastic job actually having found him in the first place. And you can see those piercing yellow eyes that they have. Unlike other birds that have eyes on the side of their head, for instance like a chicken, the owls have eyes on the front of their head 
to give them binocular vision, which allows them obviously to judge distance, which allows them to catch the food that they do. They pounce, these particular owls pounce on their prey. They eat mainly insects, grasshoppers and cockroaches and crickets and termites, but they will eat lizards and mice if they can. But being no bigger than a common rat itself, it's really restricted to just the insects mainly and is what they call a crepuscular bird. It's a bird that hunts in the transition from night to day or from day to night in that window. It's not to say that this little owlet will not hunt something now. It absolutely will. And that is one of the reasons why it is in this particular habitat. Now there is giving you another very, very good example of what else they can do just turned his head back, they can turn their heads through 270 degrees. Now just think about that. 360 degrees is a full circle. 270 degrees is almost fully around. And that is so that they don't have to shift position or break their shape when they're looking for prey. Isn't that amazing? Hunt almost silently. They have the leading edges of their wings have feathered feathers, and I know it sounds a bit weird, but feathered feathers is like a fluffy feather on the leading edge of the wings. It breaks up air passage over the wing, and it creates an almost near silent flight for these owls. So they look and listen for their prey, see it, locate it, and then pounce on it. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll land on the floor near it, and they'll walk up and pounce on it from the floor. What a comical display of acrobatics. Have a look at that. That is worth a screen grab if you've ever had one. Piercing yellow eye, African barred owlet. Now, unlike the larger owls who do not have nests with nesting material in, these little owlets will nest in a hole in a tree and they will bed their nest with fresh cut leaves. All the, all the dwarf owlets do that, the African scops owl, the white-faced owl, the barred owl, and the pearl-spotted owl are our dwarf owlets, and they will all nest in holes in trees, and they will feather their nests with leaf and leaf, leaf litter. Unlike all the larger owls who do not do that, they just use platforms, and as in the case of the barn owl, just basically a ledge, really. Oh, that is good work, Brian. Lovely little owlet shot. Not something that we see very commonly. They'll start calling around about sunset using that almost that dawn chorus or evening chorus, um, that window, a window of opportunity to whistle their calls across these little ravines. Quite often you find them in pairs in an area, but you'll never find them in flocks together. These are individual solitary little hunters. Now what we don't want to do is walk any closer to this owl. We're probably standing about 20 or 30 yards from it. And the reason for that is that these little owls do get mobbed by other birds relentlessly. And so it is actually just so awesome for us to have a look at this owl while he's watching us and not disturbing this little owlet into flight. Because invariably what will happen is a drongo or some other bird will see it. And then it becomes this absolute mob and this little bird, it spends quite some time to get away from these mobs. But on that note, and obviously with his back of his head facing us, have a look at how far away we are from him. There we go. Well done, Mr. Brian. That was a monumental effort. <laughs> We're going to send you back to James, who's with those fluffy little lion cubs. Hello, everybody. There seems to be a little bit of action going on here. I'm not sure what that female's doing. She's now obviously doing the flim and grimace. The little little youngster has come up to her, up, up to him, and he's starting to yowl and yelp a bit. And he went up to the line that's quite close to us, and she tried. He tried to sort of suckle from her, and she growled at him. And now the little ones are getting active. I think they're getting hungry, you know. 
and listen to the noises. The most wonderful noises. Jared, I don't know the answer to this question. You say, has Amber Eyes ever had cubs of her own? Given her age, I would assume that she has. Where they are, um, I, I don't know. Jared, you know, I only got here just over a year ago, and she hasn't had cubs while I've been here. But I'm assuming, given her age, I think she's about probably five or six, I'm pretty sure she would have had cubs. I did make a mistake, everyone. It's not Amber Eyes. She's so close to us. We've got them all coming up now. And they will... This is going to be an interesting little thing for everyone to see. Lions do cross-suckle, like I've said before. And now the one on the left-hand side of your picture is not happy with the situation. <laughs> Being much less tolerant of the whole situation than the other one. He's loving having the little ones around. Look. <laughs> ooh, ooh, this is interesting. Give it back, yeah. Look at the male. Yeah. Yeah. As they say, that escalated quickly. Gee whiz. That was astounding. I... They're all roaring, basically. Those little ones are roaring. I don't know what precipitated that. I've got no idea. He's now got a cut above his nose, the male does. He sat down very close to us. I'm not going to move. Really quite astounding. we try and figure out what's going on here. Let's go to Brent. He's got some little birds flying around. So we've got one for the birders. Now, not a bird we see too often, unless you're down on the open plains. Now, I'm going to let you guys identify it. Now, what I want you to look at, look at the markings around the head. Look at the color of the legs, and look at its stance. It's a very tall standing bird. Hunting along the short grass plains. Okay, there we go. That should keep you busy. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you know the answer to that, and uh, or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv but the birds are not over so another bird we don't see too often if we go onto the little bit of water that's remaining there Graham, it should be on the left hand side so oh he's disappeared into the well let's start there and move to the right slowly there we go back and center there we go 
Aha, a little wader. Now, with the lack of water being around, we haven't seen too many waders. Come on, turn your body so we can have a look at you from the side. No, we don't want to look at you from the back. Now, sometimes these little waders can be quite confusing. But I think I know which one it is. But I'm wondering, is it, oh, are you guys going to be ha able to hand a double bird ID in as many minutes? I think you can. So we will keep on him for a little bit. See if he turns to the side. It gives you a slightly better view. Now again, we want to look around the eyes. You also want to look around the shoulder. Also look at leg color. There we go. There's that very distinct movement that is an identifier of the family and then again it said look at the leg color that's an important one and then also the face mask okay remember hashtag safari live or questions at wildearth.tv if you know what those two birds are uh, they're both not the easiest but not only do we have birds we had some mammals where did they go Vim? to the right ah there they are but I think James's mammals are more exciting than ours so let's go see what they're up to Listen, those are the little ones fighting, listen to that. That is what they're going to have to do when they're older, that's how they will fight over meat. Every kill they ever go to, that is what they will do to each other. And they look so sweet and calm and playful now. But lions are by no stretch of the imagination an egalitarian society. It's each for his own. And she's now getting very cross with them. They're about to cop a horrible beating. mouth up like that, I've got to tell you, my blood goes cold. She lifts her lip like that, and that unbelievable deep throaty roar comes out of somewhere almost beyond her body. My heart is still pounding after that altercation they had. I'm sure it's got to do with one of these females being in estrus. Rina, uh, you say, is this normal that that happened? And should we be panicking? Rina, the second part of your question is easy to answer. You should not be panicking. Uh, panicking around lions fighting is a bad idea. Panicking most of the time is a bad idea. But is it normal or not? Mm. Yeah, I, it probably is, you know. I, I think it's because Amber Eyes is in estrus, and I think it's creating a bit of consternation. In fact, you may well find that two of these lionesses are in estrus, that the two lying with the male, so those two there, it's easily possible that those two are both in estrus. Why he should then have been attacked by one of them, I don't know. 
But you see, with lions, what happens is things start to escalate very quickly. And Rebecca's just said in my ear, jealousy. Yes, it might be a bit of jealousy, but I don't think so. Normally it's the males that are jealous, not the females. It's possible. But once they get... It, it's so easy to rile them up. Once they're all riled up, then it escalates. It escalates so fast. And I think that's why these Birmingham boys killed three of the lionesses of the Nkuhuma pride when they took over here, or when they started taking over here. I think it so f quickly escalates into massive aggression that there's an overcompensation, there's an overreaction to certain situations that don't require it. And that definitely helps them when they're on the hunt or when they're trying to fight off other lions or when they're trying to fight off hyenas from a kill or when they're trying to kill something as big as a buffalo or a giraffe, for example. But the disadvantage of that aggression and that testosterone, because the females do have quite a lot of testosterone, the disadvantage to that, of course, is that when things escalate, they escalate quite fast with often lethal, lethal consequences. Cheryl, are you wondering if lions are ever... Just listen to that. Cheryl, you're wondering if lions are ever infertile. I imagine sometimes, yes. But remember that, well, I guess like with any, any species, infertility is probably very uncommon because clearly if you are infertile you can't leave offspring and I would imagine that infertility would be possibly genetic, most likely genetic in cause, so unlikely to be environmental, well certainly with lions. This is, she's going to get cross now and I think it's hurting her. Can you imagine those little things fighting there over her milk, over her teeth, which must be quite sensitive. They've all got rather vicious little teeth now. Meanwhile, away from them, the other lioness, the other mother, is just fast asleep while her two very well-mannered cubs feed away. I wonder if she's not short of milk. Maybe they haven't eaten in sufficient for a little while. Let's confess that those three don't look as quite as well fed as these two here. <laughs> badly, badly mannered little things. She's being tremendously patient with them now. She's lying down. Unbelievable. And that very sweet little sound that they make very quickly escalated into a horrible, rasping kind of growl as they savaged each other. <laughs> Andrew, you say how many lionesses would kill a male? Mm. Andrew, I think at least five. Four or five of them. They are so powerful, those males, and they're built to fight. The females don't fight nearly as much. One of the major reasons a male has that mane is so that he can fight and fight with other males. He's a good sort of, not quite double the size of them. He's about, say, 1.9 times the size of them. So he's got 90% of them again. He's got much bigger muscle mass. 
He's built to fight, he's designed to fight, his whole mane is uh, made for him so that he can fight and protect his neck. Maybe three or four. I don't know that it's ever happened. I've certainly never heard of it happening. I imagine it's certainly possible that it could happen. Now look, look, here we go, here we go with some cross suckling. Look at this. Look, 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 look. Cat, you're wondering whether the I'm just going to ask your question again, sorry, so that I get it exactly. Just watch this. Oh. Cat, you're wondering if the fighting is instinctive or learned. So have they watched the males and females fighting over food and have they learned that from them? It's almost certainly instinctual, Cat. They do it from the day they're born. They will fight over milk from the day they're born. So now she's cross-suckling them. See that? So the two, I think the two there, on the right-hand side of your screen, the two on the right are the same age. I think they're hers. And that other little one has come from the other mother. And I think this female's producing more milk than the other one. Her two cubs look bigger, look better fed and they're not fighting anymore, you see that? <laughs> Romy, unlike with human beings, uh, the mother of these cubs will not take issue with an aunt disciplining her cubs. Uh, normally it's kind of a collective effort by the whole pride. Um, I'm, I imagine if an un sort of or, uh, an aunt who didn't have youngsters uh, began being too vicious with them, then there might be some kind of kickback or reaction from the mother. This one is growling now. Oh, sounds like Brent's got something fascinating. Let's quickly go across to him. Look at this, we've found in Kanyeni, and I think it's her, but literally I saw tracks on the road and I said, Fiam, these are really fresh leopard tracks. And then I said, I want to go back to where we've just come from, and we turned around and there she was. She's busy stalking something at the moment. There's quite a few Stenbok that we saw a little bit earlier. How's that, Fiam? Looks like she stopped stalking, she's laid down. I'm just gonna stay here to see what she does. Oh, there we go, I've missed this leopard. I haven't seen it in so long. She's been spending a lot of time in the Kruger. Just need to call it in on the game drive. Uh, stations one. On Sati Ingwe on Kruger Boundary CP, about 150 meters to the north of Malamala Boundary. Now, there were some Stenbuck we saw a little bit earlier, but they were quite far away from here. And it doesn't look like she's. What is she? She is. Um, Andrew, Andrew. Andrew, uh, we've located her. Uh, can you just let the guys in the east know? I'm, I, I called it in, but I don't know if they're copying me. Uh, on the Kruger boundary, about 100 meters to the north of Malamala boundary. Okay, it doesn't look like she's stalking now. Let me just see if we can find a, a little gap to get in there. Don't you love it when a plan comes together and 
Viem and I spoke about this. This is a leopard we have not seen in many a moon. And I got that report that her cubs were on Mala Mala. And we've just been working around this area. We haven't moved very far since we arrived on Cheetah Plains. And literally, we got just down there. And I looked at these tracks in the road. And I said, Viem, these are really fresh tracks. And we turned around. So we must have actually driven past her. We missed her on the way up. But all's well that ends well. OK, so fortunately, it's not too thick an area. So we're just going to get around to the other side of her so we can have a look at that beautiful face. There she is. What an exquisite creature. I think oh, it's quite tough at the moment. We've seen quite a few lovely female leopards. But in terms of pure beauty, I think she's my favorite that we see on Safari Live. That click click is just me getting a photograph. And I encourage you guys to do the same with screenshots. And remember to share all your screenshots with us by using the hashtag Safari Live or on Twitter or popping them on our Facebook page, which is Safari Live. There we go. An exquisite female leopard. She's the dominant female leopard on Cheetah Plains in Coral and the southern part of Torchwood, but the majority of her territory lies in the Kruger National Park. Now her cubs were seen in Mala Mala and the, in that big open area this morning, so she's probably making her way back towards them. What we got to hope is that she's made a kill on Cheetah Plains and she's going to take the cubs back there. But it does look like she's hunting. But you must remember, all these big cats are opportunists. So even if she has made a kill and something happened to stumble across her path, she would definitely take advantage of that. She's just listening. Oh, come on, madam. Step out into the golden light for us. Now you can see her coat's a little bit darker than Karula. All right, while she's snoozing, uh, let's go back to Bushwalk and see what they've got. How exciting is a leopard and lion on one show? I mean, we've spoiled for choice here. And talking about rare and exciting things, we bumped into this on the walk, and it's an absolute treasure. It's an elephant's bone, one of the bones in the legs of an elephant. Can you believe the size of this thing? Have a look at my skinny little legs <laughs> in comparison to, to, to this. Let me turn it on its skinniest side. <laughs> it's not too embarrassing. Have a look at that. Amazing, hey? Are we trying to decide here exactly which side this, 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 this elephant leg goes? We think that what you're looking at right now, this is where the foot goes. This is what we think. That the bone is actually uh, this way around. This way around. And it would operate like, like we're doing now. So front leg, this muscle, these muscles here would attach here. And these muscles here would attach here and what it would give this elephant is the ability to bend its leg 
like this, and then put it down and lock it so that it can put all its weight on its leg. 60% of an elephant's weight is on the front leg. And then it walks again and it bends it and it puts it down and locks it. And that's what we think. However, we don't know. I mean, how exciting is this? I don't find enough elephant skeletons to actually make a decision on that. And this is one of those things. I'm going to actually ask you, what, which part of the elephant's leg is this? Let me give you an idea of size, scale, hip height, one bone. Can you imagine that? Have a look at this angle here. And let me turn it around at this angle here. And then let me just spin it slowly for you so that you can see what this looks like. So that you can actually help me. I think this will be a decider, is this here? You can actually help us decide which part of the elephant's leg is it. Is it this side, this side, this side, or this side? Me personally and us, Herbert, myself and Brian think it's this, this bone right here. And, and again, isn't that amazing? Truly incredible. Herbie's actually brought out another, another one just here. All right. That is a hip joint, I think. Pelvis. This would have been the pelvic girdle, and the hip would have fitted in here. Although in an elephant, that is this way around. Ooh. My biology doesn't stretch to full-size examples. Might actually be the shoulder blade, to be quite honest with you. There's definitely a ball joint there. Don't know. But while you're looking at it and seeing what bones these could possibly be, please share those with us. Questions at wildearth.t or the hashtag uh, Safari Live on Twitter. But while we're waiting for those answers to come through that I can share with everybody, you're going to back to Brent and lovely Inca Nieni. So she hasn't moved, and I was just saying to VM when we were off air there, don't you love it when a good plan comes together? And we set out with the specific purpose of trying to find her on this sunset safari, and quite often those sort of plans can backfire, but fortunately today our luck has held true. So it's more than likely that she's making her way back towards uh, her cubs that are unfortunately outside of our traverse area. And I said, we can only hope that she's got a kill, that she's going to fetch them. Tasha Michelle is wondering, do I know how old in Kanyeni is? If I remember correctly, she's about 10, maybe 11. And but she is a very, very <laughs> tired cat. She's falling over at the moment. But she is a very beautiful leopard. And we're lucky enough to catch her on the move. I think the reason we missed her initially is that she was playing avoidance with a, a herd of zebra. See, even though she's half dozing, she's still listening very intently to everything around. Now, if she does, there is a strong possibility she might uh, cross our southern boundary into Mala Mala. If she does do that, I definitely know what our plan will be, is that we're going to backtrack her. So, to see if she does possibly have a kill, and she's heading back towards where her two cubs, I think they're about nine months old now, uh, where they are have been hiding. Now, 
Nikki says, when she opens her eyes, it looks like she has two eyelids and the one opens in the wrong direction. Nikki, I'm not sure what you're saying. We'll have to wait and have a look when she does it again. But I, d I didn't notice anything too peculiar there. Of course, her eyes are very tightly shut at the moment. So even though it looks like she is absolutely fast asleep, she is still very much alert. Her ears are still functioning. And if any sort of slightly strange or untoward sound would cause her to open her, those eyes in an absolute flash. Iggy says, oh my word, this leopard is a stunning creature. She is indeed. That's why I, I know I'm probably going to get into trouble with this, but I think she's the prettiest leopard within our traverse area. And um, Iggy would also like to know, what does Nkanyeni mean? Uh, if I remember correctly, it means marula tree. She does have a tendency to like climbing marula trees. I'm pretty sure, yes, if I remember correctly, Nkanyeni is... Marula tree, not to be confused with Nkaya, which is a knob thorn tree. Oh, back to snooze. I'm just going to reposition slightly. Now she's got a 4-4 four, four spot pattern and what I'm referring to is the last line of spots above her whiskers and that is one of the best ways to ID leopards although we are lucky enough to spend so much time with the leopards quite often we can ID them just from uh, having a quick look. And she is a very relaxed female. Look at that. So she's quite, uh, she's quite a, a, a decent sized female for the Sabi Sands. And she's the daughter of the Beacon female, which apparently was the great grand dam or the queen of Buffalo's Hook originally. trying to see, I mean, she doesn't look like she's starving. Oh, I hope you guys got that. I think I missed it. I think I was a bit second too slow. She looks like she is actually quite hungry, so maybe she hasn't made a kill yet. As we're a bit closer to her now, you can see one of the things that where leopards show their age is on their ears. So you start seeing tatters on her ears. Her ears are actually incredibly fluffy and good looking for a leopard of her age. But there are little nicks and tears in them. And the older a cat gets, generally it doesn't only have to be leopards, but lions as well, uh, the more wear they start to show in their ears. But she is a remarkably good looking leopard, very little rips and tears in her ears for a leopard of her age. There we go there. There's incredible paws. All the armory is sheathed. Of course, like your domestic house cat at home, she's got retractable claws. There you go, you can see that very prominent four spots above the last line of whiskers. 
So she's 4-4 four, four on both sides, right and left. There you go. Well, then, she's being very kind, showing us the other four. And back to sleep. So now we're going to sit here to see what she gets up to. While we do that, let's go across to James, who's got James, who's got some other cubs. This is fantastic that you've got these two sightings, everybody, of our most iconic cats, of course. Brent said he was going to go to Cheetah Plains and look for Nkanyeni, and, well, that's exactly what he did. The lion cubs are now very active. They've finished fighting over their milk. And I cannot see anyone with a limp. So the dire predictions of death for that cub who was injured at the... Um, injured at the buffalo kill did not come true thankfully and I'm still trying to gauge the sex of all of them they've all been playing with each other now and playing with sticks they seem to get over their quarrels much more quickly than human beings do they don't hold resentments it's so sweet And the mother's, of course, doing not much at all. The male fast asleep. He's got a nasty nick on his nose from that little fight they had. Now, that's a knob thorn that that uh, lion is chewing. Clearly not affected by the thorns that you and I wouldn't put our hands to, let alone our teeth. I think you'll find that they have a far more resilient sort of pain threshold than ours. There you see, I used the word resilient again, Eggsy. Afternoon, Mike. Uh, on There seems to be two, or at least one leopard sighting on Bifos Hook with the Mvula, and these Nkuhuma prizes on Nyala Road. Two stations here, one making his way, but I will make space as soon as the next one comes. All right, everybody, we're going to stay here for a little bit longer. I might have to move out. If I don't, that's not a problem. Let's go back across to Nkanyeni, who is now moving. She spotted something we can't see, and she's now stalking right next to us. I mean, she was literally two foot from the car. Now, I'm trying to stare into the bush to see what she's possibly seeing. As I said, there were a few steamboats around here earlier. But something really caught her attention. Oh, I just love watching the big cats and how they can move. And she's not stepping on a leaf. The patience of these cats is incredible. I can't see a stem. What can you, Vian? Well, there's definitely something she can see that we can't. But just judging about how tall she's walking, it could be still quite far away. She gets closer, she'll get closer to the ground. What she's looking at. Okay, she's far enough away from us that I can just move the car slightly. So we're going to keep our distance from her. We don't want to disturb what's going on. So whatever she's seen is in this area here. Getting lower to the ground now. Now, hopefully, it's.
She's using that as a dead marula in front of her that she's using as cover. I still can't see what she's stalking. Now, in this area earlier, there were warthogs, Stanbok, and Impala. Oh, there we go. The drongos are alarming at her. Yes, see, there we go. <laughs> Just heard those forktail drongos. Tew, 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 tew. And that was it. She's just sort of gone to sleep. Okay, well, let's try to get a bit closer again. So, whatever she was stalking, uh, with the Drongo's alarm calling it out, obviously alerted it, and, and it's moved off. Okay, so we're going to get back into a spot where we can get a nice visual of it while we do that. Steph has still playing uh, Bush CSI with those very big bones. Doesn't that look remarkably like the foot of an elephant or the skin of an elephant when in actual fact it's the top of this bone. And we've got some answers that have come through our final control on what particular bone this is. And I just want to say thank you to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I'm sure that's not your real name, but anyway, we're gonna, <laughs> we'll go with your answer. That this is the radius, oh sorry, the ulna. Now I know with elephants, the radius and the ulna, which are the two bones in your, in your forearm, are fused. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. So our original guess was exactly right. And I just want to say thank you to you there, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, for allowing us to confirm that in actual fact. So this is exactly what it would be. This, this bone right here, fused, we've got two, the, the elephant is fused, and it used these big attachment points here and here for the muscles to lift that leg up and put it down, lock it. All right, we're quickly going to Brent. Inkanyeni is busy. Okay, she just took off um, at a high speed. Oh, there she is. But she took off like a flash. We still can't see what she's after. But she just, she was lying down flat and then she shot off like a rocket. See that intense focus and there from behind you can see there are a few nicks and tears in her ear. Such a beautiful outline. I'm still, we're still not sure what she's been stalking. We haven't been able to see it. But in this area, it's most likely to be a Stanbok or a Diker. Hear a wildebeest snorting in the distance, but I don't think it's snorting at her. I just think he was snorting for the joy of being a wildebeest. Of course, we're quite close to Gnormus Gnormans area. Okay, she's going to lie down again, so we're going to move around to the front of her. Still just double checking to see if I can see what she's so interested in. Find a way through here, thick there. Right. 
Katya is saying, why do birds alarm call? Leopards don't hunt them. She can't see any evolutionary advantage in it. Well, Katya, they do. And especially when they're cubs, they hunt a lot of birds. And I don't know if you remember watching young Sindile. He was always up a tree trying to catch a bird. But you must remember that it's an evolutionary action to the shape of a cat, whether it be a big cat or a small cat. So serval and caracal and African wildcat hunt birds and they have a similar shape to lion and leopard. That is why they will alarm call at a big cat like this that's unlikely to go for a small forktail drongo. But an African wildcat would definitely try to grab a drongo. Oh, look at that. She's looking right at us. Mark is wondering, how much time would a leopard spend stalking before giving up? Well, Mark, it completely depends. I've seen leopards stalk for three, three and a half hours before giving up. And I've seen leopards stalk for ten minutes before giving up. I mean, it completely depends on the, the prey and the area that they're stalking in. Where are you off to, madam? Let's see if she comes up behind us before we move, or if she's going to pop her head up on top of that termite mound. See, she's still stalking. As I said, we have no idea what it is. Oh, look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous in the golden light? I'm jealous. You guys can get screenshots. I can't take photographs through VM. Isn't that just too beautiful? She's got very fluffy ears. Almost looks like she's stalking them. Of course she isn't. Don't worry about that. But she's come around the back of the termite mound. She's still focused on something, as I said. Unfortunately, I don't know what it is yet. You can see how close she is to us. Wow. This is incredibly special. This is definitely the most amazing sighting I've ever had with this female leopard. Whatever she's been stalking has been moving through the bush here. Now she almost seems to have lost a bit of focus. Almost looked like she might begin to chuff, call the cubs. Okay, well, we're going to keep... Oh, no, she's back in stalk mode. No, she's going to lie down. So while she lies down, uh, let's go back to James and the wonderful Inkahumas. It is a great uh, relief that Inka nearly lay down because these cubs are starting to get playful. We are going to have to leave just now, everybody. It's a two-vehicle sighting, and there are two people coming to have a look here. So we're going to pull out as soon as the next person gets here. So let's just enjoy them for the last few minutes before we have to go and we'll go see what else we can find. We might find some elephants or anything else. And just to keep you posted, you may have heard me talk on the radio there. I said Mvula was on Bivelshoek with a warthog 
I was in fact telling the truth. Mvula is on Bifosuk. He did kill a warthog today. It's his second major kill in the last three days. And Shiluva is not too far behind. So I don't know if they're still mating or not, but they might be. And maybe Mvula is going to have some new little cubs. That'll be very nice. Still haven't got the complete sexing of these little cubs. Because every time I get it, think I get them getting a handle on it, they start to sort of play around and then I can't recognize one from the other. Hello, Aaron. A good question from you about whether the father of these lions would, of these cubs would protect them from other male lions. The answer, Aaron, is indirectly. Yes, they would. So indirectly, the father is defending this territory from marauding males. He would not... Well, I mean, look, if a marauding male came along across this sighting, he would absolutely fight for them. Would he be fighting for them, or would he be fighting for his territory? Uh, by fighting for his territory, he is achieving both ends at, uh, you know, at one time. So whether there's a conscious decision from him to try and protect these cubs, I don't believe so, no. But this is his turf, this is his territory, this is where he and his brothers have set themselves up. Uh, they dominate the Inkohuma pride, the Styx pride, and most likely the Torchwood pride off to the east of us. And those are their three prides. And they will not put up uh, with any incursions from other males, and that indirectly protects their cubs. All right, everybody, we're going to have to leave now. So before this other vehicle gets in, we're going to start up and move back a bit so that they can get in. It's been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon with them. Phew! Just never gets boring with these cubs, does it? All righty. On we go. Watch the aerial there, Exi. I think what we'll do is probably head down to Buffelshook Dam, see what's going on there, and while we do that, let's go across to Steph and find out what great thing he has managed to unfurl underneath a log or something like that. Welcome back to the bushwalk, and uh, while you're taking off some time with, uh, from Nkanyeni while she's doing what she's doing, it's a good time to come and hunt for ant lions. That's what we're going to do right now. That's what I feel like doing right here. And here's an ant lion's pitfall trap. And what that is, it is an insect that literally digs a pit like this by flicking sand up and then using the pitfall to trap other insects. I'm going to see if this one's at home. Let's see. So now what I'm doing is I'm simulating an insect that's fallen in there. Usually that's enough to do it. No. No luck. What's going on? Let down exactly, Brian. Stir it around over there and see if we can see it. Sometimes if they're just a bit dormant or a bit full, they come up when you do that. But this one is an empty trap. Not that uncommon. Ant lions move and dig new traps all the time. And it's because ants really respond to ant lions. So as soon as an ant lion colony comes around an ant's entrance, they'll just simply cave in the entrance and move off to find an easier place to hunt. You know, we'll also move off to find an easier place to hunt. And lions can find some more soft spots. We've actually had quite a nice stroll since leaving that massive elephant bone, to be quite honest. Bush got incredibly thick, though. The area that we were in just seemed like every elephant that has ever lived has walked through it and decided to pick a tree to smash down. And now we've come into a slightly better area. And you can actually see that although there are some trees that are pushed down by elephant, there's actually the vast majority of trees are not. And picture this nicely, remember what this looks like, because it is actually a rarity to find these groves of trees here that haven't got this massive elephant damage that you see. We are going to approach a drainage line now. I think it's one of the tributaries to the Mulwati, if that's actually how we say it. And I want to see the, 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 this particular drainage line that we, we're approaching now is well known, to me at least anyway, for having some of the biggest and most beautiful trees growing on its verge. 
I want to see if we can go and give a big mature tree a hug today. Kirsten and Rebecca were laughing at a piece of footage that they found last night of me giving a tree a hug. I think that's what it was. And uh, so I thought that we'd refresh that by doing, by doing it again. Ooh, talking about big mature trees, this is about as big as what a knob thorn gets. This is a giant of a knob thorn. Acacia nigrescens. Getting quite big in this area, and why I say a rarity is because these, t these trees are typically quite badly damaged by elephant. And you can actually see right here, this tree has had a slab of bark ripped off of it. And although this piece doesn't carry any more nutrients for the tree, more than half the bark is left. And you can see this thick area here, this thickened area here has allowed the tree to compensate for the lost bark. So it's still growing very, very well. On that note, and something else that's growing very, very well, is Brent and Inconieni. She's on the stalk again. She's literally been lying flat till a few seconds ago. Look at that, isn't that just beautiful? Unfortunate thing is, she is heading straight towards our southern boundary, and we're not far from it. Are you going to see her there? Okay, I'm going to try and get her on. Hi, Gracie, the birthday girl. Looks like all the animals have been out and about for you today, Gracie. Um, Gracie would like to know if I've seen this leopard's babies. I have, Gracie. Um, we've seen them, I think, only once on one of the early morning sunrise safaris. But then I've seen them another time as well. Oh, hold on, Vim. So here, unfortunately, is our southern boundary. Now, we know her babies are somewhere past this road. But hopefully, she's still going to stalk where we can see her. She might come down the road next to us to use the big termite mound. She's just too pretty. And she seems to like the car as well. Keeps coming right next to us. So on a positive note, whatever she's stalking looks to be inside Cheetah Plains. Look at that wonderful tail. She's got a very fluffy tip to her tail. And Gracie, that's for her babies to follow her so they can see it when she's walking through the bush. Ken in Oklahoma is wondering when will she stop hiding her cubs? Well, Ken when her cubs leave her pretty much so once they become independent adults till then she will leave them in what she considers a safe place the older they get uh, the less choosy they are with areas that they hide their cubs they more just sort of leave them and scold them when they try to follow them but this is definitely one of the nicest leopard sightings i've had in a while Perfect golden light, 
beautiful adult female. Now she's looking down towards the big open areas and those stem book were earlier on the edge of those open areas. She spotted something else we can't see. Bring my binoculars. Let me look down the road. She's now looking east. What could be there? I see some hornbills. Some starlings. Oh, she's looking back the other way. Look at that, you can see those beautifully shaped rosettes. The biggest ones being towards the center of her back. Yeah, I'm just going to roll backwards slightly. So Tasha and Michelle would like to know, do we see anything at all out there that she might be hunting? Well, the only thing we saw in this area, but earlier, before we found her, there were a few stem bork around. How's that, Fiam? You happy with that? Perfect. Beautiful. We're getting a bit of a, a golden light on her face. I hope you guys are getting some incredible screenshots. I'm going to snap a picture. Don't even need a big zoom lens. She's so close to us. There she goes. She's going the wrong way. Hello, pretty girl. She's heading into Mala Mala, and that's where her cubs were. But there's a very good chance she's going to be back across this boundary uh, by tomorrow. We're going to stay with her as long as we can. Roger's wondering, is she primarily looking, hearing, or smelling? I would say for leopards, it's sight and hearing probably are the two more dominant uh, when it comes to hunting. Oh, she's going to climb right to the top of that massive termite mound. Look how she's using her body. She's draping it across. So if there is anything on the other side, it's not going to spot her. So it looks like she might be settling there. I'm just going to move a little bit, see if we can get a, another view. So she's using that massive termite mound as a nice vantage point to look for potential prey. And there are quite a few. I'm just trying to find a clear gap for you there, ma'am. Oh, I think this is going to be some nice screenshots. Look at that. You can see how big that termite mound is.
I think she saw a Stenbock when she made that initial charge. And I think she, it might have run into that area. So we're going to sit here and just watch her from a distance. Unfortunately, she, she has crossed into uh, Mala Mala. While we do that, let's go see how Steph's faring on foot. We found one of these granddaddy trees and you caught me having a hug. Yes, I like hugging big old trees like this. You're looking at a couple of hundred years, who knows exactly how many hundred years this tree has on us. Just look at this giant. I just want to give you an idea of exactly how much of a giant this is. Brian's going to go around the tree. That's my full circumference. I'm six foot from fingertip to fingertip. Herbie is about six, well, just under six foot, fingertip to fingertip. And look how much trees left. Massive amounts. What do you reckon, Brian? How many more people? Four people, five people? At least four. At least four more people. So that's six people, the circumference of this tree. Yes, please. This is one of the giants here in the Kruger National Park. This is a fully mature full-grown African ebony or jackalberry diospirus mispiliformis that is the name of this particular tree and isn't it an absolute wonder oh just standing next to giants like this is enough to make you feel insignificant and all the things to give you an example this tree watched the first plane fly over South Africa, it watched the first car come into the Lofelt, probably saw the first people migrating into permanent settlements. It saw Juma arise, it saw petrol cars, it saw diesel cars, it saw tractors. It's seen countless leopard and lion, generation upon generation, all of Karulas and Mvula, well not Mvula, but all the female, all the lionesses, and all the female leopard in these areas saw all their cubs coming into, into this particular area. We were just saying, where we'd even start to climb up this tree if we were being chased by a bunch of elephants. And I don't actually know where I'd start climbing this tree. I think we might actually... I said on one of the outer branches, Brian just laughed at me, which I think was probably exactly what he needed to do. <laughs> Ground me in some reality. We, we've been trying to estimate how heavy we think this particular tree is. Jackalberry wood is dense. I don't know exactly how dense it is. You know, compare it to lead wood at 1,400 kilogram per, or let's say that two, 3,000 pound per square meter or per square yard. What that would end up working out to, even if you halved that, that this tree is a couple of hundred tons, probably around about that. I do know that the biggest tree on earth is also the biggest living organism in the universe as far as we know and that is General Sherman, a sequoia redwood in North America. He weighs two and a half thousand tons. I don't think that this grandpa is quite that that heavy but I would wager that we're looking at a couple of hundred tons at least. Amazing. Anyway, that's my story for this afternoon and um, we're going to be making our way back through to the lodge. We may have some time to squeeze in a segment or two. So I won't say goodbye just yet, but we are going to be making our way back, racing the sunset. And uh, while that's happening, you're off to James. Have a nice time. Now, everybody, there seems to be some form of family squabble going on over there. I must just say I'd have paid money to see Steph and uh, Herbie trying to hug a tree together. Steph is not what one would describe as a hugger, I wouldn't say. So quite interesting to see the two of them awkwardly hugging the tree and, and therefore each other. Wonderful. Those are three Batelier, and they're a family of Batelier. We know that two of them, the mum and the dad, have a nest around here somewhere. I'm pretty sure the one on the left-hand side is one of their offspring, uh, from a long time ago because they're all well over well the adults are obviously over seven years old the youngster looks to be about seven as well we know that because they have all got their adult plumage so that's quite special no now Eggsy I'm going to challenge you deeply here look you've got to get on that bird I think it's a Wahlberg's eagle I think it's the first Wahlberg's it is it's the first Wahlberg's everybody there it is ha 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 
The first Wahlberg's Eagle, everyone, of the season. Have you got it on screen, Eggsy? Well done. Hooray! What's the date? It's the 18th. Gracie, if you're still watching, age nine, on your birthday, the first Wahlberg's Eagle of the new season has just arrived. Well, the first one we've seen. And you've got him on a tree there. Yep. Fantastic. Let's go back and have a look. Don't frighten him, Iggsy. Isn't that nice? I've been waiting for him for some time now. Let's go and have a look. Which tree did he land in, Egbert? One of those ones there. <laughs> the far round one. Okay. Everyone, he's on the far round tree. Ah, I've got him. It doesn't look like a round tree, it looks like a stick. Okay, let's go and have a nice look at him, just to confirm. I'll tell you how I identified him. Very thin tail, cross-like uh, profile as he flies. So the wings don't bend like a vulture's. Well, he's quite a long way away. But we may still get a good look at him. That's wonderful. Very exciting. Let's quickly get just... It's not going to be a great view with this camera, but we should be able to get a view. Here we go. We'll just get past this lot. All right, Eggsy. Here you go. It's your moment to shine. Again. Are you sure that's the bird? It's starting to look rather awfully big. That's a Wahlberg's eagle. That's him. Look at the little cap on his back. Let's just watch this bird carefully. I'm having a horrible, horrible feeling here. Are you sure this is the same bird, Egbert? That's the bird that went to go and sit. Are you 100% sure? Yes, because this is the far round tree behind us. And it seemed like he's whistling in that tree. That's a tawny eagle, that's not a Wahlberg's. That's the bird. Eggsy? Yes, sir. Are you lying to me? I am serious. Eggsy says this is the bird that was flying and that landed over here. Yes, sir. <sighs> I'm so deflated. That is a tawny eagle. I know that because of the different colors on his back. You can see them even at this distance, everyone. You can see very clearly the black on the back there and the brown. From such joy to such dreadful sadness. Never mind, everyone. We'll get through it. Gracie, I'm sorry about that. I thought it was a Wahlberg's eagle. I was fairly convinced, as you may have heard from my rather excited babbling. We could just, of course, pretend that Eggsy had seen the wrong bird land. I don't think he did, though, unfortunately. Sorry about that. <laughs> I can't believe you've ruined my afternoon, Eggsy. Thanks so much. It was all going so well. We saw nice battaliers, beautiful lions, Wahlberg's eagle that morphed into a tawny. Thanks. Right. We're going to go off towards the west and see if we can find something else. While we do that, Nkanyeni is still on a termite mound, sitting in the golden light like that tawny eagle that isn't a Wahlberg's eagle. See you just now. Oh, poor James. Well, hopefully James does get to see the first Wahlberg's eagle of the year after that. 
there she is. She's still sitting on that termite mound, posing a beautifully. And while she's within sight, Vim and I are not moving. Oh. What have you spotted, madam? Now, there, are, there is a herd of zebra moving through where she's looking at the moment. I think that's what my, maybe she's listening to and looking at. Obviously doesn't want to go home to the cubs without any food. Definitely looking at the zebra. Well, I almost forgot we had a bird quiz on the go. Uh, we've got so distracted by this gorgeous female leopard. Now, James, Richard is correct on both counts. It is uh, the African pipit and a wood sandpiper. Now, Elaine, you were very close with the green sandpiper. So there's the green sandpiper, but the giveaway was the legs. The wood sandpiper with the yellowish, yellowish, dull yellow legs. That was the giveaway. Right. Oh, she's up. <laughs> Enough of birds. She sat up. Oh, isn't that just too pretty? I can't help but take another picture. Think about moving back to cheetah plants. Now, we want a stenwalk to appear behind us somewhere. And one of the reasons we see so little of her is due to the fact a large amount of her, her territory falls within the Kruger National Park. Other than that, she traverses about half of Cheetah Plains. Tundi has the other half. And then most of Nkoro. And then into that south eastern corner of Torchwood. And then a lot of her territory is to the east in the Kruger. So I'm always very excited when we catch up with this exquisite leopard. Now, if we come out, you see how big this massive termite mound is. And William in Oregon is asking, how long does it take for a termite mound to get that big? Well, William, there's quite a lot of different, uh, well, it's quite a, a heavy discussion point, but uh, I've heard it, they can take up to 800 years to get that big, which would mean there was, uh, it wouldn't be in one termite colony's lifetime, it would be multiple termite colonies or multiple queens. Same colony, multiple queens. I'm just adjusting for the light as it disappears there, so we do apologize about that. 
heads up, ears are up. Now her cubs can't be too far from here. But while we wait patiently with the Queen of the East, let's go to James who's got the African sun disappearing over the western horizon. That is not true, everybody. We do not have the African sun disappearing. We have the African sun that has, in fact, disappeared in the past tense. It's gone. It's gone away. It's no longer with us. You can hear I'm still in a foul mood after my uh, misidentification of that beautiful bird. Anyway, Higgsy, let's just have one. Don't look at my uh, ugly mug at the moment. It's far too sad. Let's just have a look at the dimming horizon there. It's a stunning, stunning evening still, it's warm, the hornbills are calling, but the sun is gone. You can hear just one brass section, one covey of crested franklins going. Take a deep breath in, Eggsy. That's it. Air is very clean and fresh. And it is just touched slightly with a slight hint of sweetness and that comes I think from the knob thorn flowers that are just starting to come out one or two guari flowers starting to come and they're the ultimate bird of peace the ring-necked dove Right, let's head back across to Stier van Winterboer. I hope that he and Herbert have managed to unentangle themselves from, well, the tree and each other. I think they want to say good night to you. We'll carry on towards the west. Mm. Looking into the, on, the onrushing night you were having a look at over there. We've just been admiring the bush, quietening down. We sit here we were just having a bit of a chat about the day and quiet settling down there's always such a peaceful feeling out here in the african bush at sunset good idea to get out a gin and tonic or a cool drink or an orange juice or whatever it is that james refers to his evening beverage as being uh apple juice there we go apple get in us apple juice out <laughs> and um oh we've had such a fantastic day busy day out here in the african bush Days are getting longer, thankfully. Uh, they are getting hotter. Today was about 76 degrees centigrade, I think, at its, at, its, at its warmest. And we're looking at an increase in these temperatures up to October, up to and including October at least anyway. So we're going to have some warm days uh, coming. And let's hope the rains come this year because it will mean that the hottest days are in October and not in January. But um, anyway, from my side, we need to head back before it gets dark and we become part of the food chain again. So from myself, Steph, and from Brian, and from Herbert, uh, we just want to say thank you once again for all your questions. Thanks for replying on that elephant question there, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Much appreciated the confirming our CSI. And uh, I just want to say enjoy the rest of this evening's game drive with all these special cats that you're with. So all the best. Catch you next time. So she still is sitting atop that massive termite mound, listening, looking to the south, which makes me a little sad. I wish she was looking to the north or to the west. It's just the most serene setting. We come out wide as the sun's dipped below. We're looking at this female leopard looking over her domain. And I mean, you can see how absolutely massive that termite mound is. It is a beast. Definitely one of the tallest ones around. I hope 
and tomorrow's sunrise safari she brings those two cubs we've only seen once on the on the live drives back onto cheetah plans so they're somewhere around this area now she's looking down towards a bigger open area behind there is a little drainage system in the middle and that's where the cubs could be Did, you can see some nice big jackal berries in it come on come back come back stenbooks live on cheetah plants not on mala mala or are you going to give us one last glance before <laughs> breaking our hearts Now, if any of you are new, you are looking at a female leopard live in the middle of the African bush. And if you're wondering about it, pop me a question. Questions at wildearth.tv on email or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, you can see through to the open area beyond there. It's just stunning with the winter colors. Now, are there any animals on the open area? Doesn't look like it just yet. She is looking back to the west was looking back to the west. Yeah, that is a beautiful shot. I don't know why, maybe it's just the composition, but that, 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 that view really appeals to me. That wonderful orange of the bush willows looking through to that large brown ivory without any leaves in the distance. At, at, Nice composition. It, really, it, it works for him. It really does. You can still hear the zebra moving through the bush. I'm going to almost just make out some stripes. Could make out some stripes. They disappeared um, in there somewhere. There we go. <laughs> when I literally barely a stripe visible. Hi, Mimi. Mimi is 15 years old. Uh, Mimi would like to know, will leopards kill zebras? Very, very unusual, Mimi. Zebra is too big for a leopard, definitely too big for a female. Oh, she's coming down. Is she coming back towards us, Viv? Fingers crossed. Could we be that lucky? Viv, we're that lucky. I was convinced she was going to go south. I shouldn't get too, too, too excited yet. She might go back to the crew. <laughs> Sorry, Mimi, I got distracted there. Um, zebras are a bit too big, unless there's a baby zebra. And even then, for a female leopard, a baby zebra is even sometimes a bit big. And zebras can be very aggressive, and they'll defend their babies against predators, uh, specifically small predators. There's only one leopard I know of was... A massive male who used to kill baby zebras regularly. And he was probably double or triple, no, not triple, double the size of what she is. 
Now she's walking towards where those zebras are. I'm going to try it. I don't, she's not hunting. You can see she's not going into that stalk mode. But we might get a, an awesome screenshot of uh, stripes and spots. She's still walking. She's standing still. I've lost sight of her. She's still on the road. OK. I'm just going to move so we get the possibility of stripes and spots. That would be a good one. We can just see her tail. Here she comes. I see she's gone off into the bush slightly to avoid those zebra from spotting her. And she's coming straight back to Cheetah Plains. And said, oh, I shouldn't get too excited, she might go into Kruger. Oh, there we are. Zebras have spotted her. You hear that snort? <laughs> there still is the possibility of the stri stripe in the spot. Then if we come out quickly, there we go. Stripes and spots. Hello, lady. Oops, sorry, I was trying to get my head out of the way. No, don't go that way. She's heading east, and the majority of her territory is in the Kruger Park. We'll stay with her as long as we can. So not heading back to pick up the kids just yet. She's got no dinner for them. We're right on the Kruger National Park boundary now. As I said, we're going to stick with her as long as possible. But you can see she's heading towards the boundary. But if she walks along the boundary, we can stay parallel to her. But looks like she's got other plans. Here we go. Moving into the mixed woodland of the Kruger National Park. Now, with the cubs still on that, around that open area to the south, there's a very good chance she might be in this area again in the next day or so. But as she melts into the African bush felt and to an area unfortunately we cannot follow. Let's go see how James is faring on Juma. It's that beautiful, perfect, wonderful time of the day, everyone. The changing of the guard, the sun has gone down, the last of the drongos are calling. And that there is a hole where we found a lilac breasted roller setting up a nest this morning. And just fluttering down, he's obviously inside or perhaps away, collecting nesting material. But just beyond there, in fact, just at the base, is a drongo flying. I'm just going to try and roll forward. And this drongo, the drongos love to come onto the ground at this time of the day. Little spotted eggsy. Not quite a Wahlberg's eagle. 
Um, would they love to come onto the ground at this time of the day? I don't really know why, but they're the last birds to stop calling, the last diurnal birds to stop calling. And they're always low down, just before the darkness falls. It's just the most wonderful time of the day, and if you ever come to Africa, or maybe it's the same wherever you are, but for me, to be silent around this time of the day and contemplate things, oh, it's just perfect. Just hear the odd drongo calling out a little bit like a... Look at that. Calling out like a pearl-spotted owl. <laughs> and maybe there are a couple of insects that have come out at this time of the day that stick low to the ground. Maybe they emerge from the ground and that's why the drongo is sitting there. He's definitely hunting. That forked tail really helps him with hawking insects in the air so that means flying and catching them on the wing I'm just going to roll down the road and you'll see what I mean there are a whole lot of them on the road in front of us flying to and fro in the last of the day's light you can see there Eggsy one on the bush there that you can see that small scraggly bush. Here comes another one into screen. That's it. Eggsy's on fire. And the one on the road's back there, Eggs. There we go. See, he's staying low to the ground. I wish we had electric cars. We could drive at this kind of volume all the time. for little bits, little insects coming up off the ground. I'm not sure what insects they are and why they happen to be on the ground at this time of the day. Has anybody got an idea? It'd be great to know from you. Isn't that cool? It's doing a Franklin call now. A bad one. They're not great mimics. They attempt valiantly to mimic birds. I'm not making things easy for Eggsy, my moving, while we're, he's trying to film a moving bird. Anyway, that's the forktail drongo in the dusk. Isn't that nice? I think it's very nice. We're going to go past Treehouse Dam now, and see what's going on there. I don't think much, but I was rather hoping Karula might come back across here. She hasn't spent much time on Juma recently, and so perhaps she'll come back during the night and kill something and feed it to her babies on Juma tomorrow. Oops. As I said to you this morning, uh, not always easy to look you in the eye and drive in a straight line. It's another drongo to our right-hand side. Oh, gosh. Sorry, Eggsy. I'm going to leave him, though. There's another one. Oh, silly bird. It just flew away, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. I can pick up a head of steam again. Let me help us along, Eggsy. Thanks for the help, Eggsy. No, you did nothing. You just sat there like a passenger. <laughs> it's not safe to get out of the vehicle, that's correct. Good. Well done. Your instincts were absolutely correct. For you to get out from where you're sitting and back on again without doing yourself an injury would have been almost impossible. Come on, Wendy. There she goes. That's it. Well done. Right. While we willing Wendy down the road, let's go across to Brent Lear Smith and find out if he's heading back to the west or still with that beautiful leopard.
Well, what a fantastic, fantastic sunset safari. Uh, Vim and I had a thoroughly amazing time and it was quite special. We were right on the edge of Cheetah Plains on the boundary of the Kruger and uh, we also got very lucky. We were so far away that we had that leopard all to ourselves for that whole sighting, which is always a special thing. Uh, not that we don't like sharing, but it is quite special to be able to just spend that amount of time by yourself with a big cat in that beautiful light. Saw some amazing behavior. But the one downside of being where we were is we're about as, we, we were about as far, we actually were as far away as we can get from Juma and from camp as possible. I guess probably driving distance, about how far do you reckon, Vim? You think it's driving? Yeah. I think it's a bit further than that. I say as the crow flies, probably eight. I think driving maybe 10, 12 k's. Wait, oh, we don't. Our odometer stopped working on this car many, many years ago, so we can't actually, uh, actually um, measure it. Maybe quite an interesting thing to measure. Vim? You're going to have to fix the odometer on the Land Rover. You think you can do it? Oh, right, use my cell phone. I didn't think of that. Now I feel sheepish. Oh, well, I have to do it from there next time. Start with the beginning. Yes, that wasn't very clever. But we are going to do one last gander past three in a row pan. You never know. There might be something spectacular there. Who knows? Maybe Mr. Q might make an appearance before the end of the safari. And it could be some Ellie's. We're not too far away from it now, probably about a minute. And we've already layered up. It's been, it's getting quite chilly. The temperature's dropping rapidly as uh, the sun, as, as the sun disappeared. There we go, we're arriving at three in a row pan now. Who knows, we could see another smaller spotted cat. I know Jamie's seen serval around here a couple of times. Also I could see some jackal, which we've seen at this time of the day around three in a row pan. Okay, we're approaching the pan now. Eyes are peeled. What awaits us at the water's edge? Unfortunately, nothing. So there we go. This is where we were hoping to find something, but there's nothing. So VM and I are going to hit the long road back to the west, hopefully everyone in camp has made a fire for us because I think we're going to be half popsicles by the time we arrive home but it has been definitely worth it spending that time with that incredible female leopard so from Vim and myself on the rust bucket we'll see you bright and early for the sunrise safari wait honey badges what's wrong <laughs> just today is the gift that keeps on giving is another one coming to the road that's a little one, a young one. Get my spotlight, get my spotlight. We'll see if we can get another view of them. Oh, Vim! Well spotted. Oopsie. I'm so excited, I'm stalling. excited about something see the tails up and the one on the right is probably a sub adult there's mom digging is she going to find something for the little one to eat nope nothing in that hole mom mom I'm hungry Let's try one last peek. Oh, 
Oh, no, I can't see them. Can you see them, BM? Oh, there. I think I saw an eye. There they are. Got them there? Look at that. You can see the eye shine. <laughs> Look, that's a young one. One with its tail up. Oh, it's having a silly moment. <laughs> no, they're disappearing into the bush uh, through there. Wow. Well, let's try that again. <laughs> from Vim and myself, from the most spectacular cheetah plans uh, that has provided us with incredible leopard. And now, uh, just a honey badger bonus towards the end of the safari. We will see you bright and early tomorrow uh, for the sunrise safari. <laughs> Toodles. What a spectacular sighting. Marvellous. Honey badgers? We haven't found any honey badgers, have we, Eggsy? No. We did find another three or four drongos, though, which we were very pleased about. Well, I was. Eggsy just went, there's another one. He also has not spotted a Wahlberg's eagle. <laughs> Hello, Gracie, age nine. You say, don't be in a yucky mood about this bird. <laughs> Because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You're absolutely right, Gracie. Especially not on your birthday. And I'm glad, I hope you've had a good birthday drive. I think we've had some wonderful things for you. Elephants, and lions, and lion cubs, and Inkanieni the leopard, and fork-tailed drongos, and a tawny eagle. Not a Wahlberg's eagle. Poor old Eggsy, it really is not his fault. Uh, we're going to go up onto the quarantine clearings and just enjoy the last embers of the day. There is a smell in the air, everybody. It is definitely the first harbinger of the spring. Ah, it is sweet. It is subtle. And I think it's the knobthorn trees, but I don't see any knobthorns around us right now, so it might be something else but it is just delicious. Oh, and a bit of potato, also a bit of smell of the potato bush. So we'll just pull up here and then we'll stop and say goodbye to you. There we are. All right, everyone, that's going to be us, it from us today, not us from it today. Thank you, Eggsy, for uh, destroying my life today. Uh, it's been a pleasure being on drive with you. Uh, big thanks to Brent and VM for their spectacular work on cheetah planes. And a big thanks to Rebecca and Louise in the final control. To all of you, especially, for your questions and comments and coming on drive with us, it's been great to talk to you. Gracie, happy, happy, happy ninth birthday. We'll see you tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari at 